open. All right. Great. We good? Test, 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 test. Testing? Testing and testing again. It's a deep couch. I like it. Very comfortable. All right. Good afternoon. Well, actually, it's good evening. Hello to you all who might be in the back. I'm sorry to interrupt your studying, but you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, so tonight we have a symposium titled The Souls of Black Folks, a symposium on sneakers in black community. Uh, this is one of the events sponsored by the Humanities and Technoscience Lab, and we'd like to thank our sponsors, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, who uh, through the Disco Network is helping support this. We would like to thank the Honors College for allowing us to use this wonderful room. Um, we would like to thank the American Studies Program for supporting the effort um, that we've been working under through the last several year or so. So thank you for all those participants who've helped support the effort and the work and the collective activities we've been um, thinking about. So what is the Souls of Black Folks about? This symposium explicitly fronts the limitless possibilities of blackness, particularly the ways in which the national popular culture is formed upon our backs and inked in our skins. Sneakers are truly an American commodity, and as such, there's also no blacker one. We, as a vibrant, beautiful people, dance, laugh, and thrive in sneakers. While we are not responsible for their manufacturers, we made this, we made this. Um, but also, this optimism must be balanced by uh, balance on the reality's fulcrum. Otherwise, it would not just be non nonsensical fantasy, just we live, we also die in sneakers. As such, the sneaker doesn't just represent black athletic brilliance. Instead, sneakers in, in our collective mind conjures black folks, natal preser preserving essence, how in an anti-black world, our shoes can and usually do look as if they've never touched the ground. So we're here to have a conversation about sneakers and why sneakers matter, why blackness matters, and I would just say the beautiful aesthetic magicalness of a fresh pair of kicks. So today we have a wonderful panel, and um, unfortunately, two of our panelists were not able to make it, um, one due to sickness, and the other had to make the McDonald's All-American High School game. Um, unfortunately, these things coalesced and he was not able to make it. But notwithstanding, we have a spectacular panel and we're excited to have uh, the group with us. First, we have uh, Christina Pornabib, who is editor of the coffee table book, The First Pair. Her work considers how sneakers become an entry point into the broader subject of race, gender, class, and identity. After participating in Nike's Air Max Accelerator program, Christina expanded the focus of the first pair to create first pair plus the next pair. So thank you so much for being with us, thank Christina. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Next, we have Mike Sykes, sports culture journalist for USA Today. He hosts Special Delivery, the popular sneaker YouTube show, and writes the always informative, relevant Kicks You Wear newsletter. So thank you for having, being with us, Mike. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And then finally, we have Aaron Dial, who is the postdoctoral fellow with the Humanities and Technoscience Lab. And Aaron's research um, is working on finishing up his first book titled Deadstock, The Philosoph Philosophy of the Sneaker in the Afterlife of Black Bodies. This work articulates the intimate and undiscussed connections between sneakers as material objects and black bodies. So, again. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you. So, today we would like to begin by having a, uh, asking our panelists a few questions. We would love for people in the back to join us and ask some questions if you have them. But uh, I guess we would like to begin by thinking about sneakers and culture and all the beauty of this. So, um, I guess the first question I'd like to begin with is, I think about sneakers as artifacts, and artifacts have memories. So I would like for you to begin by um, telling us a powerful, memor memorable, or even downright humorous or troubling story about sneakers and your life. So 
I guess ladies first. <laughs> Not to put you off. on the spot. <laughs> But no worries. Christina, please. Um, so I actually come back to this story a lot because it was the catalyst for a lot of the work that I do. But um, when I was about 17, I camped out for my first pair of sneakers. Um, it was the Air Jordan 11 Space Jams. Um, I had never camped out before. Um, my parents didn't know I was camping out. I don't even remember if I told them maybe I was at a friend's house or something, but I didn't know I wasn't going to have service underground in the parking structure, so I definitely got in trouble afterwards. But once I got the shoe, it was worth it. Um, but I just remember that night, um, it wasn't that many people, but I remember looking around and it feeling almost like this like secret society, you know, of this group of people, they're willing to sacrifice sleep, to sacrifice safety for a pair of sneakers. And I also spent my money on getting that pair. And I remember opening the box the next morning and it was so, it had the patent leather around the silhouette as well. And I remember seeing my grin in them and I just felt like, wow, like this, I did it, you know, like I didn't sleep. Like we ran through the mall to go to the stores to acquire them. And that really was a moment for me where I wanted to learn more about the history and the story behind a pair of shoes. I was like, if I'm going to spend money, if I'm not going to sleep, if I'm going to be in this community, I want to understand it beyond just this pair of sneakers are dope. And so that kicked off a tradition. Like every holiday season, I camped out for the Air Jordan 11 release. And some years were crazy. It got a little bit more violent. Um, and eventually I had to kind of like step back away from like camping out a bit. But um, it definitely felt like a community and people that really love sneaker culture. And that's what got me into it. And that really was the catalyst when I look back on what started the work that I do today. So two questions. What city and do you still have them? Absolutely. Um, and the city, <laughs> I do. And you know what? I wore them not that long ago for a shoot and the, uh, the bottoms, my soles are, are coming apart a little bit. So I do have to get those uh, repaired. Um, but no, it was in Los Angeles, California. So sneaker culture is huge there. So it definitely um, ran through me from a young age. Sneaker culture was all around L.A. for sure. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Mike. So my, my story is kind of similar where I, I didn't stand in line for my shoes. I had to like, it, 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 it's a much more like long form game of like me, I'm 15 years old, I guess, in 2007. The 2007 um, Aqua Jordan 8s. This is the shoe that I feel like is the most important one on my journey. It, it's really what kickstarted the, the whole thing for me, my love for sneakers. I remember begging my parents for those shoes and my mom's like, I'm not just going to give them to you. You're going to have to work for this. And so I'm doing all this yard work. I'm picking up sticks. I'm cutting people's <laughs> grass. Like I'm doing whatever I got to do um, to get this <clears throat> pair of sneakers, right? And, and so I, I do all the work. I finally get them. I'm, I'm so pressed. The shoe is so beautiful. It's not like the, um, the OG version where it doesn't have the gray on the heel, but it was good enough for me. I had seen Michael Jordan in this shoe, okay. and th I have that shoe now. So... It was just very important to me, and um, I just remember wearing them to school for the first time. Oh my goodness! Like the 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 joy that I felt from just getting a head nod from people, like your shoes are fly. Like where'd you get those from? How'd you get them? Just those questions. Like I just always wanted to to bring that feeling back, you know. And and so from that point on, it was just I was I was I was hooked, man. I was hooked. It, it just it captured me and it made me love sneakers and, and feel something for them that I, I never really felt before, right? Like I, I, my parents, they were really good to me. They, they always got me shoes um, to, to start the school year and, and I was always appreciative of whatever pair it was because they were clean, you know? And, and I'm just, I was just grateful, I was thankful like that as a kid. But getting that pair, it just, it, it forever changed my outlook and I, I'll, I'll never forget it. So you went to the emotional very early. I heard you say love. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about your relationship with emotions and sneakers? It's, it's weird, man, because just being infatuated with inanimate objects, like, the, like it, it, it's like weird. It's, it's kind of an obsession. It, it really is an obsession. Like I will 
week to week, what, what's coming out? What can I get? What do I? What's what's the next pair that I'm a that I'm a cop? And like, what do I have to get rid of to to now move this new pair back in? Because like, I try, my thing is like trying not to have too many pairs at at one time because I can't I can't wear them all. I just can't wear them all. And 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 so it's um it it really and when I'm selling the shoes, it pains me. You know, it's like. <laughs> I can still wear this. Like I, I don't want to give it up, but at the same time, I know that like if I'm bringing in a new pair, then I probably should. But at the same time, it's like ah, it just hurts. So, so like there, there is a, a genuine, a genuine love within it, and it also comes from connectivity with other people, right? Because like this is a, a communal thing where you, you go out and you meet people who are like you, who have that same obsession, and and you can obsess over it together. And so you feel you feel a part of something, something that is that is bigger than yourself. And I think that that's something that that everybody can appreciate, whether you're a sneakerhead or not. Like, there's there's some community that that you're a part of mm -hmm. um, that means a lot to you. And and this is one that that means a lot to me. Thanks so much, Mike. Aaron. Yeah. So my story, right? Is I guess I I won't tell the story of my first pair. I, I'll tell the story about uh, an important sort of sneaker person in my life. Um, and uh, it was this guy I went to high school with, his name was Adrian. And uh, the one thing I, I loved about Adrian, that we all loved about him, is that he was like, like the ultimate hustle man. So he would like, in high school he was selling snacks, right? He was selling water, he was, doing, he was cutting people's hair, he was doing everything, but he also sold shoes, right? And he sold shoes because he worked, he got, had a job at Foot Locker. Um, how we got the shoes, that's questionable, but that'll make the story, the, the, the story, all, it, all this comes full circle, right? And, but one of the things that he really, he did, which I always loved, he would let people who didn't have uh, sneakers, he would let them wear them around school, because like, in like 2000, 2004, when I was in high school, right, like, I mean, I guess kind of like how it is now, like people were getting like eviscerated, right, like roasted or whatever, um, if you weren't wearing the flyest kicks. But one day, so one day it's, uh, in this locker, um, three cops come um, and they raid his locker, right? And like we all thought either um, they were looking for drugs, they weren't looking for drugs, they were looking for sneakers, mm -hmm. right? Foot Locker had found him, found out that he was still in shoes, and he had like, like almost like maybe like seven or eight pair of like cool gray uh, Air Jordan 11s in his locker. And the reason why this story is funny because this story leads to the first high speed chase I've ever seen on foot. So he, like, they, they take him out of class or whatever. There's your locker, open the locker. He opens the locker, um, and he's running through, the, like, the school, like, in and out of classrooms, and, like, the cops are, like, running after him. It's, like, a crazy thing. He ends up, he ends up running home, and the boy doesn't realize that the cops have your address, so they're just there. Um, but, yeah, no, like I, like, I always think about Adrian a lot or whatever and think about sort of, one, how sort of community for black folks often sort of exists sort of uh, um, on the fringes of the law, on the fringes of sort of what is legal, but always about sort of what is sort of uh, holistic and healing, right? So, so, so I think of uh, Adrian Lott when I sort of, um, when I'm sharing shoes with friends, when, I, where, when I'm with friends trying to get shoes um, and stuff like that. But even like the work I do, because the work I do I think is, is a lot about sort of understanding um, not just how blackness as a sort of construct sort of uh, uh, sneakers are sort of built in and around that, right? But how black folks, like real people, right, have sort of made this a thing that we all um, know and love today, right? So, so Aaron, you went to a historical place. You went back in the past. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about the history of, of the artifact, right? The history of these objects. Because you talked about you know, we're ask, I asked you about these moments in the past, yeah. and you can mark time in a sense mm -hmm. by sneakers. Yeah. Do you mark time by sneakers? Uh, you, yeah, I do. I mean, like, yeah, my 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 sneakers app, my confirmed app is always is always uh, buzzing every week with, with drops. So yeah, I definitely definitely mark time by sneakers, right? But no, um, but like thinking about like the past, right? Sneakers sneakers are a very old artifact, right? An old thing, like. This is, we're talking about like in the 1830s, um, English pimp soles, um, right? And it comes, like the reason why we get sneakers is from uh, vulcanized rubber, right? So um, what happened is sort of uh, European colonizers, they were going to Brazil, right? Literally stealing uh, uh, um, rubber seeds from the rubber tree, right? Like stealing and planting them in other countries, right? There's the, the India Rubber Company, 
um, and stuff like that, right? And so they were stealing sort of uh, uh, these seeds, these resources from um, the sort of indigenous uh, communities, right, and building industry around them, right? And of course, like before sort of, like for me, I think like, I think sneakers effectively starts as like a thing with Michael Jordan, right? But like there were sneakers like way before Michael Jordan. You have Converse sneakers, you have sneakers in, in the um, 60s and 70s, right? But like sneakers as a thing that is, um, goes beyond sort of the sports shoe, right? And becomes a sort of a ubiquitous thing of fashion that sort of uh, really now sort of blends, if, if you look at, at the artifact today, like blends the idea of sort of like, uh, um, elite, high class, wealthy, uh, uh, um, an elite, high class, like wealthy thing, versus a sort of like proletarian, like everyday object, right? Sneakers exist in both things and in neither one simultaneously, which sort of I think, but it's it, it's a very sort of interesting sort of historical trajectory of sneakers. So, so thank you for your opening introductory comments and getting us into your your place with space about sneakers. Uh, continuing this question. I think the, we'll move next to thinking about identity and sneakers. And so, how does your identity, wherever you define yourself, whether it be blackness, whether it be gender, whether it be Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, Aaron's from the South. North Carolina, baby. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of the South at the moment. So, <laughs> so, so how does your identity and how you identify yourself shape your understanding of what you love about sneakers? Are they symbiotic? Are they reflective? Do they grow together? How does that shape how you see your affinity for sneakers? Well, for, for me, um, growing up in the DMV area, uh, as DC, Maryland, and Virginia, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest brands in that area that people wear are New Balance sneakers. We just, I, I've literally always known like my older cousins, people I see on the streets, um, people I see in stores. Like they always, they were always in New Balance. I never understood it um, growing up, but like you, you just have the pairs, right? And so I'm thinking that like this is something that, that everybody wears. Like when, when you go to, to different states or whatever and, and you go to, to different countries, like I'm thinking like this is, this is a go-to brand and it's like, no, it's, it's not. It's just a, it, it's, it's, your, it's your area and that's the, the culture that, um, that is developed in, in your, your, your circle. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that is unique to, to the region um, and it's something that started all the way back in the 80s when, when the brand first popped up. And, you know, I, I found myself, um, as I grew up, it was, you know, I, I went through that whole phase of, like, trying to be the, the anti-kid, the kid who's, like, rebelling against everything. And so it's like, I'm not wearing New Balance. Everybody else is wearing New Balance. And so, like, for a while, it, it just didn't really, didn't really stick with me. But then I think around that same, like, 15, 16, 17 age, it was like, no, like these shoes, these shoes mean a lot because they carry a lot of history with it. There were, there were people, people who, who, were, who were older than me, who are beyond me, um, who know more than me about this culture, who were wearing these, these sneakers. And, and like to be able to, um, to connect with them in that way about these sneakers, especially now that, that like the brand is, um, it's ascending in a way that it hasn't before, previously um, in, in, in the mainstream and the zeitgeist, it, it's, it's like, it, it, I feel like it's a, it's a very special thing to, to sort of see, especially now, knowing that, that the city that I'm from was the one that was really wearing this stuff, and now everybody else is doing it too. So you, you kind of, you, you have a sense of pride, right, in, um, in that, that origination. And, and it, 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 it's something that makes me proud. Um, when, when I think about just the general style of, of the place that I come from. And then like I think about my family too, um, especially, especially my mom, because my mom, does, she doesn't wear sneakers, but if you go into her closet, man, there are so many pairs of heels. And I'm just like, I, growing up, I, I never understood why, why she kept so much of that, right? Like I'm like, mom, 
she, she, she'd have me clean out her closet. And I'm like, you don't even wear this. Why am I organizing this? And she's just like, just do it. Just do it. And, and now I realize, like, now that I have, I probably have more shoes than her at this point. But now, now that I have, you know, I have a lot of sneakers myself, it's like I can finally, I can, I can connect with that. I can understand it. I can understand the, the, the moments, the history, um, the, 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 the time that, that these sneakers come from. And, um, and just, you know, being able to wear them in those moments, like, it, it really means a lot. It means a lot. I'll pick, I'll pick up on okay. that. Um, well, when I think about identity and I think about sneakers, I automatically go to blackness and black cool. And I don't think that we can really discuss one without the other. And um, Aaron mentioned, you know, really seeing this boom of sneakers with Jordan. Um, but even taking it a step back to like sneaker culture, streetwear culture, that really started in the streets. Mm -hmm. and. You know, we, it's just kind of like, and, and it depends to the area that you're in, you know, like LA, New York, DMV, like we all have a way where we put it together, but it's still individual. And that was a moment where people rocked a sneaker because they really liked it. You know, it didn't have anything to do with it being cool or it being hyped or, you know, it selling a lot on resale markets. It started with groups of people that were just fly and cool. And it's just like, it's, it's everything that you embody of what it is to be black. And that goes hand in hand with sneakers. It's like, um, it's kind of like a history. It's, it's talking about black history is talking about sneakers and the influence. And, you know, um, I think when I look at it, like I, I imagine LA, right? And I'm, and I'm in the space and I remember, you know, when I see like women that were older than me, like wearing Jersey dresses and wearing like, you know, their Jordans and scrunchy socks or, you know, wearing Vans or wearing Cortezes. Like I can remember certain shoes that you couldn't wear in certain areas, you know, and also like certain danger that comes with certain sneakers, but also, um, sneakers have a way of allowing you to express yourself. It's self-expression, it's self-identity. Um, I put on a pair of shoes because I rock with it and because I know it looks fly. I'm not worried about what anybody else is thinking. Yeah, I might have a little bit of LA flair with it, but um, it, it's, it's wearable art, you know? It, it is, yeah. it's, yeah. it's self-expression at its finest. Um, and I think that it's something that um, really speaks to I mean, black cool. No, yeah, I, I think for me, right, the, the question of, of identity, right, I, like I, I think of identity in two ways, right? So there's sort of the, sort of like the identity that is sort of like socially constructed. Like so for me, right, sneakers are important. Um, one, because I think as a, a PhD now and teaching at a majority white cam uh, campus um, uh, and uh, it's important for students, especially black and brown students, to see um, a man who looks like me sort of in sneakers, right? I'm not in a suit or whatever. And like, it, 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 like it, it, it's weird, like the reactions I get, like, it's not like oh, like you're wearing those? Like, it, like people are like always surprised, like, like I'm like 80 years old, like, 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 yeah, I wear sneakers. Like sneakers have been around for a minute, right? You know? Uh, but also I think like there's another part of identity with sort of Christina touched on is sort of, the imaginative sort of aspect of identity, right? And I don't mean imaginative in a sense like sort of fantasy, right? But imaginative in a sense of like, we have made something that wasn't there before, made up a, like a, a material world, right? So when we, when we think about sort of black cool, right? This idea that sort of in the, in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, right? There were no hype beasts. There were even no sneaker heads, right? It was just kids in New York, in LA, uh, um, in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I'm from, in the DMV, all over the country, right? Just rocking shoes, just getting off a of fit because that's, that's what, they, what they did, right? And then also, right, I think we have to sort of like take identity sort of if we like, if we brought, if we go beyond this idea of, of black cool, right? Sneakers sort of, I think, represent uh, what, I, what I call sort of an, an essential technology of urbanization, right? So if I asked 
everyone here, if they had a pair of sneakers, not, not if they had a pair of J's, but they had a pair of sneakers, I'm sure everyone would raise their hand, right? That is not an accident, right? That is because sort of sneakers have ingratiated themselves in sort of uh, a kind of urban and quasi-urban culture, suburban culture. We wear sneakers when we're doing nothing and we wear sneakers, people wear sneakers when they're doing the most important things. Like I defended my dissertation in a pair of J's, right? But also if I'm going to the grocery store or whatever, I might be in a pair of J's, right? So like I, I think sort of like, and, and sort of bringing this full circle and bringing it back to black cool, right? Yes, black cool is something that we all sort of like, we all like, and I say we all, like I mean sort of like a universal we, right? Understand from jazz to hip hop to sneakers uh, to, to, to dance to, to whatever, right? But black cool is fundamentally about reshaping structures and reshaping literally the world, right? And, and sort of rearticulating it back out, right? Um, so yeah, so I mean, for me, I guess that's how I think about uh, identity with, with sneakers specifically. So, so continuing with pushing this question about blackness, right? Uh, particularly black cool. Shoes have changed. Mm -hmm. Styles have changed. So let's kind of move a little bit to the land of, of fashion and aesthetics and style. So. What do you see as the relationship between the evolution of blackness, of evolution of black cool, but also the transient nature of fashion and style and aesthetics? And so the question is, what makes certain sneakers last and certain sneakers disappear, right? Is it black cool? Is it culture history? Is it identity? Is it aesthetics? Is it something unknown, magical about I that? mean, that's a great question. I think for me in particular, it's history. It's the story behind the shoe. Um, I might not have been old enough to watch Jordan play, but I remember the stories I was told. I remember going back and watching him play. I. I remember, you know, the flu game and what he did, you know, like, and going crazy on the court and him wearing those 12s and me wanting to have a piece of that history. And, you know, I might not have the OG pair, but I'll get the retros, you know, and it's like having this piece of history and um, that that is the connectivity and always the connective tissue for me. It's the story behind the shoe. That's what connects us all together now. That's what we're talking about is the stories. That's like human connectivity um, and being able to do that around a pair of sneakers, like that's amazing. And then you can look at the overlap with fashion as well. Um, look, we can look at like back of like Air Force Ones and looking at Nelly. I can look at like Peli Peli, um, Aniche, which I just learned is actually pronounced NYC, which I just refuse to say because I, I've always <laughs> been called it Nietzsche, Nietzsche my whole life. Uh, yeah, it's, I'm it's like, it's, that's news yes, to me. Yes, <laughs> it's news NYC. to me. It's a Nietzsche forever. <laughs> I know. And, and you know, and the, I, you see styles, how they repeat themselves as well. Yeah. You know, like the, the baggy silhouettes and it, uh, styles repeat themselves, but it's also, it's that nostalgia feel, it's that history, and it's the stories that really connect us through our fashion and our sneakers. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I completely agree on that. And then like to, to just piggyback on that a little bit further, when you talk about black cool, I mean, when you look at all of the, the, the style and aesthetics that we have today, a lot of that is started by black folks, mm -hmm. right? Like when you think about Jordan sneakers, who is Michael Jordan? A basketball player, yes, but also a black man. You know, when you when you think about um, the the wave of, of New Balance right now, and uh, um, DC was Chocolate City back then, right? Like this was this was something that that black people started. It's it's a it's a trend that was formed and and, and shaped by by black folks. And so I I think that there's there's um there's a lot of pride to be to be taken in that. And I, I think it's also something that. Um, a lot of folks don't really, I, I don't want to say a lot, because like folks like us, like we obviously know this. Like we, we, we know the history, we, um, we love it, we appreciate it, and it's why we, we do what we do. But at the same time, I feel like there is 
um, there are people out there who just kind of brush over the history, right? Like the, these white cement threes that, that just came out. Like there, there are people who want this shoe just because of, of the resale value, for example. And that doesn't, that doesn't even come close to, um, to defining what this shoe means uh, to somebody who, you know, who, who grew up watching Jordan, who might may have seen the, the, uh, the dunk contest in 88 and, and seen the debut of, of this sneaker, right? And so I, I think um, it, it, it's very important to, to kind of hammer that, that home, the fact that like black cool is, is not, it's not just what we're wearing right now or the trends that we're setting today. There, there's just so much stuff that predates that, that makes what we do, that makes everything that we do today relevant. So yeah, for me, right, I think, so I guess, I guess to me the interesting thing about your question, right, is the use of the word fashion, right? So to me, when I think about fashion brands, right, I think about sort of, like it's a very sort of fickle industry. There are very few fashion companies that last maybe like a decade or whatever, because trends change, right? So like, for example, a Nietzsche NYC, I don't know, are they still making clothes? Are they still, are they still in the... I don't know, but the, 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 the fact that we have to ask, right, goes to show you that sort of things change, right? Um, but sneakers, right, the sneaker companies have persisted, right? And I think sort of if we, like, it's, it's weird. I, I don't think of sneakers, I think of them as being fashionable. It's for, me, but for me, thinking about sneakers as equipment sort of is really, really important, right? So, like, to me, like the sort of, I think, the, 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 the magic and beauty of, of Nike Air as a tagline, right? So like to, to sort of, I guess, provide a, a brief sort of history, right? People, when people were so thrown by the idea that there, were, there was air in your shoes, right? They were literally like cutting Nikes up to see the air, right? It was, it was a big, it was like, like, it's a wild thing. So it'd be like, I'm taking uh, Sykes' threes and like ripping the soles off because like, where's the air, right? And so re really what it is, it's a polyurethane bubble, right? It's literally a bubble cushion it, right? But to sort of market that with sort of the, the transcendent potential of a black body and Michael Jordan, right? And it's not that Michael Jordan could dunk or whatever that's the, that, that they were marketing. It's that people thought Michael could fly, right? And then sort of thinking about how, right, blackness has always been sort of a part of this sort of American fantasy, right? Like black bodies can all, have always had this sort of uh, potential, potential to do sort of fantastic things. And I mean fantastic in a sort of, in a way that sort of may be considered good or whatever, but also like fantastic that is in a, in a way that could be to our detriment. Like black folks can work harder, they can bear more pain, right? Um, but yeah, so like the fact that sort of sneaker companies have persisted, right, is sort of really, really amazing to me because like if you think about sort of them as for example like tech companies right the sort of the sort of the structures that they had to to build to sort of allow these sort of, like allow this persistence and allow sort of generations of people to have sort of and to collect these same sorts of memory right because there i mean there are people here who are 19 20 right they have no memory of the uh, the Michael Jordan flu game, for instance, right? And there's a word for that. It's called uh, anomia. A n o m e i a. It means you have a nostalgia for a memory that you never experienced, right? And the fact that sneakers capture that, and people still sort of want that, and Michael Jordan still has residence. I mean, I think my, he's like a sixty. He's a sixty. He's in the sixties, right? He's definitely in the sixties. I, I mean, have no idea how. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, he's he's a man in his sixties. He dresses cool. like a man in his sixties all the dad jeans or whatever. Like Michael Jordan is not a fashion, I mean, he's no Ralph Lauren, right? He's a, he's a guy who played basketball really well and became the best sort of brand spokesperson in American history, I would say. But like the fact that sort of generations of people are still sort of in rapture with him, right, is a testament to, I think sort of, at least in North America, right, the sort of sneaker, the sneaker company's ability to still brand black bodies, right? And like, I mean still, cause like, like I'm sort of linking that to sort of uh, the slave brand, right? And, and, and being intentional about that, right? This idea that we can sell blackness. I mean, cause when you were stepping into a Jordan, for example, like you were stepping into what was a molding of Michael Jordan's foot, 
right? That is a wild concept to me. Like with clothes, it doesn't, it doesn't do that. Like you might be, you know, you might put on a fly sweater, a fly pair of jeans, a fly jacket, right? But it's not the same thing as sort of stepping into that fantasy, whether you're trying to capture sort of the, the history of the sporting moment or trying to capture the history of the fashion moment or trying to just sort of uh, be cool as everyone else is cool or speak the language like of OGs and sneakerheads and IBs, which is all black culture anyway. So I, I, I think sort of that, that's my sort of, I guess, thoughts on, on the fashion, like fashionability of sneakers. And, and just to kind of piggyback on that point, the, the point about, um, you know, the, the, the sneaker companies being able to, to sort of market the, the, uh, the coolness of, of the black body, right? Like that, that also we've seen now that doesn't really go away. Because when, no, yeah. when, when you think about um, you know, Kobe Bryant and, and his tragic passing, like yeah. people are still going crazy over his yeah. sneakers right now. Yeah. Nike is still selling those shoes. Virgil Abloh, there are still off-white Nikes yeah. in and production. And they continue to do that. Yeah, and yeah. they're going to no. continue to do that in, yeah. in, in perpetuity or however long the, the deal lasts that, that, no. they, that they sign. But, that, that's something that it, it, it really doesn't go away. And, and honestly, I, like, I get conflicted sometimes when I think about that because it's like, at what point do, do these folks get, get to rest? You know, like yeah, at, yeah, at what point yeah. does, at, at what point do, do, you, do you stop capitalizing off of, off of this person? And it's like, you know, you, you participate in it and you love it, but at the same time, it's like, do, D does everybody have the same appreciation for it? And, and I, mm -hmm. I just get conflicted with that a little no, bit. No, yeah, and, and so, and I think, like, one, you bring up a, like, interesting point, because sneakers, like, now is in a really sort of, I think, interesting and maybe sort of dangerous place for sneaker companies, right? Because, like, we've reached a point where I think we have, we have been reached a point where sort of the black basketball player or the black athlete is not the sort of, is not the super effective billboard as it was in the late 90s or early 2000s, right? Like Michael Jordan was the billboard, right? And now, like for example, basketball shoes, like those sales are not um, are, 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 are not nearly as big as, as big as they were. Like LeBron James shoes, like like they they're not do, doing nearly the numbers that I mean, they're still a very successful shoe, but not doing ne like nearly the numbers as Jordan or whatever, right? And that's and I think there's a lot of reasons for that, right? So one, I think the shoe has so much technology in it that like you can almost only wear, for example, like a Jason Tatum or a Ja Morant one or a Luca one, right? You can almost only wear them to play basketball, right? If, like, I mean, like, you, I mean, like, I, I like to tell people, like, think about sneakers as less as a fashion object, but a computer, but all the chips are made of textiles. Like, that's how, like, that's the sort of, like, the sort of, Intense, intensity of labor and sort of production and design that, that goes into them, right? But to your point about, like, Kobe, right? Like, we got to remember that, like, Kobe, like, was thinking about, before he passed, he was thinking about leaving Nike, right? Mm -hmm. Because Nike, he, he wanted the, the billion-dollar lifetime j deal that LeBron got. Um, Nike was like, nah, the Kobe thing is, is, is cool, but that's not where we're going. He passed, and then the demand happened. Right, and then Vanessa Bryant with the uh, Kobe Bryant Foundation, right, got the uh, uh, got like signed this huge deal, right? Like, I mean, like there was like, I mean, I, I think there's a short lived, but there was a drought on Kobe's. Like, people could not find them, right? Because and like that was the demand, and Nike realized, like, oh, okay, like, well, now after his death, the the popularity has, is is such a way now where like I guess I mean, even in life he couldn't have he couldn't have reproduced that, right? So, I mean, but yeah, no, I think like, but the thing about like Kobe, but the, the sort of, the shift between like the basketball shoe as the fashion shoe, and now we have stuff like, oh, we used to have stuff like Yeezy, right? And which was, like, went crazy for Adidas, right? But also the demise of Ivy Park, mm -hmm. right? Like the fact that Adidas couldn't get that right mm -hmm. with um, arguably, arguably um, the biggest star in the world, Beyonce, is, is crazy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's so much stuff that goes into, into that sort of that, that, that shiftiness of, of fashion and stuff. So let me ask you, Aaron. So you said that Adidas didn't get it right with Ivy Park. Or was the marketplace of sneaker culture not ready for a woman to lead oh. a sneaker silo? So I think, I, I think, and we were just talking about this earlier, so I, I, I would love for Christina and Mike to chime in. Yeah. I think 
a lot of stuff, I think that, so I don't believe in simple answers. I think a lot of stuff happened at once to sort of uh, like lead to, lead Ivy Park to sort of being a failed sort of experiment. One, I think sort of if we compare sort of Beyonce it, to. I don't know if it's a failed experiment. Well, I mean, so, I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, they've ended it. So, I mean, like, I'm sure if they could, if, if Adidas thought they could sell more Ivy Park, they would be selling more Ivy Park. So, I mean, but, and, 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 and so I, I mean, I mean, I mean, failed in this way, right? So the difference, if we're comparing Beyonce as like Ivy Park to Yeezy, right? Both Beyonce and Kanye West are fashion icons. And I'm going to put aside all the horribleness for a second that Kanye West is about, right? But both Beyonce and Kanye West are fashion icons. They're different fashion icons. Kanye West is, or is, has always been sort of caught up in being, and been caught in being the fashion designer, right? Beyonce's sort of fashion iconness, right, is uh, is sort of in the in the thing she wears, right? Which which is very which is different things, right? And so, like one thing about uh, Yeezy is we always saw Kanye in Yeezy. We always saw him in Yeezy, right? B Beyonce, as Sykes and I were talking about this, I've only seen Beyonce in Ivy Park on the commercials. Or not commercials, but on, the, on like the, the sort of, uh, like the marketing stuff. Well, right? they also didn't give her a signature shoe, though. Exactly, yeah, no, so. that's true, that's true, that's true, that's true. And I think that's, I think that's part, of, part, uh, uh, I think part of Adidas's fault, right? Yeah. And then, like, I think sort of also, and I think this is, this is really, really important, uh, that Adidas is based in Germany, right? I think the company did not, I think holistically, in a way that Nike does understand, did not understand how to market effectively to Beyonce's base, which is unequivocally black women. So I would love to hear what Mike and Christina yeah. have to say. Yeah, I, I mean, I, just to follow up on that point, I, I think um, the, the point about Adidas being based primarily in Germany, like, they have no idea what's going on over here. Like, it, I, I feel like for, for so long, the, the company um, just kind of rode the back of Yeezy when it comes to, to their business in, in North America and just let everything else kind of do what it does and, and everything. And, and, and with Beyonce in particular, I feel like it, it, it's... it's it's just really disappointing that, that it, it shook out that way. I don't really look at it as a, as a failure either. I'm just yeah. extremely disappointed that like it didn't really work out. And I feel like there, there's certainly blame to be placed on both sides, but I also don't think Adidas knew particularly who they were working with. It's, it's like mm -hmm. you, you have Beyonce, you, you have her audience who, like you said, is unequivocally black women. And, and it's a very passionate audience that, that we've seen before. And the the sort of allure um, that that comes with Beyonce is is kind of the mystery of Beyonce too, yeah. where like you you see like when when she's rolling an album out, it's like it's quick, like like she comes she 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 makes like she she might drop a single, uh, but it's all it's all very quick. You don't you don't really know what's coming, and she comes out of nowhere, and you have no idea what the sound is about to be. You don't know what it's what it's going to be like. And I think Adidas anticipated that Beyonce would be like the, the front facing character like, like Kanye West was going to be. And that just is, is, has, has never been her. And I think this also kind of speaks to your point about maybe the marketplace just wasn't ready for a black woman like Beyonce to, to be in that position or Adidas in particular wasn't ready to, to, to have a, a woman like Beyonce um, in that, that position. Not to say that Beyonce isn't ready for it because obviously she's the biggest star in the world arguably and and so like i, I don't think you can say that like sure it, it'll be it would have been great to see her have ivy park on like an album album cover or something like that but at the same time i think you have to to know your audience you have to know the the star that that you're collaborating with and i i just don't think adidas did did really any of that homework it, it just felt to me like the company was like, okay, we can put this deal together. Let, let's make some shape. And, and that just doesn't really cut it because the consumer is so smart. Like people are so smart now. You can, you can sniff that stuff from a mile away, mm -hmm. especially Beyonce's fan base. Like mm -hmm. they, they, when it comes to their girl, they do not play. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and so when, when you see, when you see something that just doesn't really feel right, like, you know it. And, and I think people knew it. And I think that's why, the reception ultimately was what it was with her. 
Well, I don't know. I don't know if it's an excuse that, like, not being ready for a black woman. I just, like, you can go out and hear from what, like, black and brown women want. Like, it's not hard. They can send people out. They know their, the audience. I think it was just a huge misstep. Like, what I said, why does she not have a signature shoe? No, like, yeah, something exactly. where it's like, that's the first step right there. So it's like, you're not even allowing the space for this to happen. Not that it's not, like, the space isn't ready for it. Sure. It just speaks to the overstep of women in this space. Mm -hmm. And... um um, constantly under representation because again, like the biggest star, why do we not see a signature shoe? Like that in and of itself was a huge misstep. Yeah. So what would you say if I were to say that maybe part of the question is that so much of, I would say, contemporary sneaker culture hinges upon a nostalgic black masculinity that the limits opportunities for anyone else to enter into this space? I think, so I think there's two ways. One, I think you're, you're right. I think sort of, one, sneakers have always been masculinist, right? I, I think, like, I mean, I, I, think, I think, like, we can't sort of ignore that, right? But I think, right, and I, I agree with Christina, right, like, black women, especially brown women, especially, have been in sneakers for years making like just crazy dope stuff. I mean like like I mean honestly like like to me like one of the dopest sneaker moments and we're going back to Beyonce, right? Uh, is the sneaker heel, the Air Force one the, the I guess that the Air Force one and the, the Timberland boot heel, mm -hmm. right? That, Beyonce did that, right? Like so I mean like like to me like she 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 already had like the sort of like the the chops, right? And and again, I, I don't I, I it's it's hard for me to take sort of the idea that oh we, we we don't know how to tap into Beyonce's audience as 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 a like a viable excuse right because like I think so so for example we were talking before this right and like to me the easiest money that Ivy Park mix missed was when Beyonce did the homecoming concert and she had the Beta Delta Kappa shirt or whatever the fact that they, that did not have Adidas logo right above that and they weren't selling those things for eighty dollars a sweatshirt or whatever is a huge miss, a huge miss, right? And so, and like, and to me, like, I think th this, like, th the question about Beyonce specifically, right, gets into sort of the, the really sort of, like, just the weirdness of Adidas. Right? I mean, because honestly, I don't think Adidas has done right by, I don't think Adidas did right by, like, Run DMC, for instance. Like, I remember on the 25th anniversary, there was no, like, uh, sort of mention of Run DMC and the superstar, right? I mean, like, I mean, so I mean, like, like I think sort of like Adidas is 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 just weird because of the Europeanness, I guess, to our sort of like American sort of sensibilities, right? But and and also, I don't I don't want this conversation to be sort of like Adidas got it wrong, Nike gets it right, right? Because I think like Nike still has a ways to go. When it comes to sort of what uh, what sort of women in sneakers look like, and I think about sort of the sort of uh, the con I guess controversy is like a, I guess a, a maybe a, a a big term, but like the sort of tension around the sort of the uh, Nina Chanel Abney mm -hmm. too, right? Mm -hmm. And like how like sneakerheads, mostly men, right, were like, oh, yeah. this is a brick, like a like a horrible shoe or whatever and didn't get it, why does it cost $250? This woman has designed it, these are the ugliest twos ever, or whatever, when what you got, if you actually thought about it, right, you, like, you buy the shoe, but you got a piece of, like, an actual piece of art in the hang tag, like, that, that you can't get anywhere else, she's like a famous artist or whatever, like, that's super dope, right? Super dope, right? Uh, but, like, that, though, that sort of, and I felt like, so for that example, I felt like Nike kind of, threw her under the bus a little bit, or just let her sort of be out there and sort of dangle in this sort of very, like, very masculine sort of conversation around sneakers. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I think sort of like, to, yeah, I guess, I guess the only thing I just want to say is that sort of, I felt the conversation was going to like Adidas bad, Nike good, or whatever. And, and I, I think it's, it's, I think there's more work to be done sort of overall with, with, with sneakers. Like the sneaker I'm most excited for is Sabrina Ionescu's uh, her first shoe. It's a beautiful shoe. 
like a beautiful shirt. I can't, I can't wait to buy, I can't wait to wear it and have all the colorways, right? And I just hope like the community, like I, ho I hope that they support it and it does well as some of the other shoes. But even with that shoe, like we, we talk about Black Cool, right? Like Sabrina Ionescu, she, she's a, a great athlete. She's a great basketball player, amazing, uh, amazing talent. But at the same time, when that shoe, when I saw that that shoe was coming, I'm like, where is Asia Wilson's shoe? Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. She, she is a, a, a WNBA champion, an MVP, a, mm -hmm. a defensive player of the year. Like to, she's 26 years old. Mm -hmm. There is really no excuse that, that this black woman does not have mm -hmm. A signature shoe right now, and 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 I just think that I don't know. It, it it speaks to the 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 issue that that I think Black women face when it comes to sneaker culture, and and just kind of always being overlooked. Not only when it comes to something like um, signature shoes and and the opportunities that that certain athletes or, or certain collaborators might get over others, but even something simple like just sizing. You know, it's yeah. just like yeah. it's, it's yeah. just like regular stuff that not just Nike, not just Adidas, everybody gets wrong. You know, and 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 like Christina said, like there's a, a community of Black women um, out there, always been eager about sneakers, mm -hmm. always been eager to communicate with brands. They just don't really do the work to to do it, and, and it's it's really a shame because. There are just a lot of women out here, in, including this one sitting right next to me, that are just doing some really, mm -hmm. really dope stuff, and, yeah. and the brands just need to tap into it. Well, mm -hmm. that's when you start to see more women creating their own spaces, yeah. right? Like, you see people like C&K Daily who create platforms for women, highlighting women, like Christina, who was um, supposed to be here on the platform. Like, even when you talk about, like, criticism for um, Nina and her Jordan. And it's like, this is an artist, and yeah. she has her hang tag of like this dope art, and still there's criticism in there, but that has been like the history of men and women. So with Christina's platform, it's an all women private space where she releases um, like sneaker drops. And it's private for a reason, so if women ask a question or if they get a fact wrong, they're not going to be criticized by men in the space. So I think to your question, it's twofold. I like, guess this industry is successful on retros, right? And recreating the history and nostalgia, which is great, but it also runs the risk of not having new models, not having new representation, not having future for silhouettes, and amazing dope women that are in the space that are overlooked. Like we are starting to see it little by little, but there's still so much work to be done. But to your point, like women are just done waiting for companies and corporations to always hear them. So that's why you're seeing these really dope platforms um, come about. Um, dope magazines and even like um, women in sneakers a great space she just never saw Julia she never saw um, black or brown women in sneakers and she's just like I know there has to be more women out here so it's like we're doing our own research we'll, we do our own work and that's the same thing with me I wanted to add my voice to the conversation about sneakers so I put out a book you know like we'll make it happen you know and sooner or later like people always pay attention people are always looking so yeah. so We've been dancing around the conversation. I, I want to talk about markets, right? Secondary, tertiary, quaternary markets. And so how do you feel digital marketplaces are shaping and influencing what sneaker culture is and the meaning of sneakers? I'll pick up on that. Okay. Um, so I think it's changed the landscape completely, right? So. It's twofold. You have opportunities now where anyone in the world can buy any pair of shoes. Like when we would camp For the right out. Price. Yeah, exactly. But I'll get to that. Okay. So when we when we would camp out, right? Like, okay, you're getting the shoe if you're getting it that day. You might get it on Craigslist. You might find someone you can do a swap with, but it was pretty much you got it in that moment. So now we have the means to be able to um, like go online and find a pair of sneakers or like someone who wants to like have a Jordan or they didn't see Jordan play, like they can go online and find that. The problem is um, 
at its core is neoliberalism, right? Like, if you can buy it, you can have it. But you have to have means to be able to acquire it. So what that does is then that's pushing out communities of color, low-income communities, the people that poured into this culture, made it what it is, and now they don't have the access to be able to afford certain shoes. Also, like digital marketplaces, it's now setting the benchmark for the value of a sneaker. It's no longer about the historical element or the story or just buying a shoe because you like it. It sets the benchmark, which also makes it dangerous because people just buy things because it's hyped. So again, there goes the cultural appropriation of it, the communities of color that poured into this very community and made it what it is, don't even have the access unless they have the means. So if you have the means, cool, you can get it. But if not, like, oh, well. So it's, it's twofold. It started as something great where it would allow anyone to have the access, but it becomes dangerous of setting the benchmark and then boxing the very people out of it that gave this culture life. So just another financial marketplace yeah. using shoes as a commodity that excludes certain groups of marginalized communities. Absolutely. No, yeah, and, and one, so I, I, I think for me, and, and I think uh, Christina brought up great points, right? Like, it's this idea of the sort of, this fallacy of democracy, right? That the internet brings, right? The idea that theoretically anyone can have access to anything at any one time. But we know there's, there's tons of barriers, right? For example, like you, you have to have a commuter, computer, you have to have an internet connection, stuff like that, right? But I mean, it is very convenient. Like, so I, I can't remember the last time, like I went to a store, picked up a shoe that I didn't know I was going to buy, like, mm -hmm. like and said, oh, this is really dope. Whatever, I'm going to I'm gonna buy this shoe, right? Can't remember the last time that happened, right? All my shoe purchases, or like 99% of my sneaker purchase, purchases are online now, right? But I think something that Christina touched on, which I, I really want to hammer home, right? I compare the sneaker industry a lot to the video game industry, and people are like, oh, like, why do you do that? But, but so I'll explain it, right? So one, like, video games, so it's like Sony or like Microsoft, right? When they sell their Xbox, or PlayStation, right? They sell the Xbox or PlayStation at a loss, right? These are like, t at the time, like really high-end computing de the device. The fact you get it for like $600 is a, is a steal, right? Because the, 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 where they really make money is selling software, right? Selling the games. You have like, you have one system, you might have 10 games, right? Sneakers do the same thing, but in a different way, right? So Nike, re or in a Nike and Adidas, for the most part, they realize that they cannot sell a shoe for six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred, a thousand dollars, right? So what happens is like the resale, like the resale market becomes a sort of marker of a shoe's value, right? A shoe sort of like, like I know, for example, I know uh, Sykes shoes are fly. I know Christina's shoes are fly because on StockX. These are six hundred dollars. I'm sure those are like those bread elevens are probably like in the thousands or whatever. Like if she sold them on stuff. So I so so the price does that thing. Like I know that they're fly because they cost this much, right? And so, but what that does, it right, it makes the sort of retail drop more intense, right? Sneakers are the only industry where they have told us, and we believe, like we as in like me, right? Not we as in the universe, like we as in me, like. When something drops on sneakers, right, and I get, I get it, I get the got them, the got them alert, I am hyped, right? Like, I don't feel like that when I'm going to get gas, right? I don't feel like that. I'm serious. I'm, I'm serious. Like, I don't feel like that when I'm going to, like, get some chicken wings, right? Like, like the fact that I am, like, hyped, like, I have won the lottery. I have gotten the privilege to purchase, right, is, is I think, the biggest sort of, like, stick of like digital of the digital marketplace right because i can look and see like on like i think that shoe i think was 210 retail something like that like like 210 retail i can yeah. see that on the on on the sneakers app right i can go on StockX and try to buy them before it releases right before it releases like on uh to to the to the to the uh to the to the main sort of audience or whatever and i can see it already be $500 Right, that's like, and so like, and so then the mindset is like, oh, I'm actually getting at a discount, right? And, and this, I think, sort of the weirdness of sneakers and how sort of sneakers have become gentrified, right? Because, right, in pricing sort of black and brown folks 
out, right, we had this sort of fallacy of, of luxury, but also this fallacy of democracy that like anybody can get a shoe if they have the right price without asking should a pair of uh, Travis Scott's or whatever be $10,000, right? So, I mean, like, it's, it's, it's tons of stuff that, that, sort of, that sort of goes on with that. Yeah, and it kind of stinks because, like, the, there's, no, there's no real way to change that without just not participating in it, mm-hmm. right? Like, you, yeah. just, you just have to kind of not do it. Like, you have to delete the sneakers app, the confirmed app from mm-hmm. your phone. You have to not go to StockX. You have to just, like, just be like, okay, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. It's, it's fine. But then, like, you get on the Internet, right, and you, you go to Twitter, and you see all the bottom screens, and you go to Instagram, yeah. and... You see the shoe right there, and like it looks great. Like that's a great photo. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, it's really just like it, it, it's it's literally the gamification of sneakers. It it mm-hmm. it, it is so close to gambling, mm-hmm. y'all. I'm telling you, it, no, it, yeah. it, it's crazy. It is yeah. crazy because like every you, you just asked me how much these shoes were. I have no idea. I don't know. I know it was like two two something. Yeah, yeah, it was two yeah. something. Yeah, I don't know. Really but know. the fact that I am willing to just go to this app and pay to something mm-hmm. without blinking or batting an eye. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just like, it's, it's very problematic. And when you think about the people who are the ones who like that, that's kind of the, that's, that's the, that's the last ditch, right? Like, yeah. that, like you can't, you don't have a bot. So, yeah. so, you know, you can't, you can't go and, and buy up 10 pairs of these. Right? Yeah. Like, there's no mm-hmm. guarantee that you're going to get it. Yeah. Like those are the black and brown people that set this stuff. Oh, no, yeah, you know, right. and, and yeah. that's where I just like it, it just gets so again, it, it just like it's, it's so conflicting for me inside because I'm just like, man, like I really love this stuff and I really want to keep participating in it. But at the same time, it just feels like the the whole thing is just kind of it, it's, it's always going against you. There are always headwinds, and and the only way to to get out of that, like I said, is to is to not do it. And, and yet, yet here I am with these sneakers on. So. Yeah, I mean, to, and to me, I think another thing that we haven't touched on yet that sort of I think is a de- direct result of digital sort of marketplaces, right? Is this idea that sort of sneakers are like that somebody can discern authenticity. And by authenticity, I mean like both sort of like. Uh, like you are an authentic member of the community, but also that your shoes are legit, right? So there was um, a black woman who went viral. I think she works for she's at uh, some con, but she uh, works at eBay. The, the, the eBay? eBay, yeah. Right, and she yeah, and she went viral because she was at, at the con. And she's like going. She gets the box. She takes the shoe out. She's smelling the shoe, and she's like, "Oh, this shoe is real." And she does it like pretty quickly, and like mm-hmm. and it's, it's it's really amazing to watch, right? It's, it's almost like if you ever watched like Antiques Roadshow back in the day. Or whatever, and they had the people, and they're like, "Oh, this is thing is a fake." You always like, and then this thing is real, this thing is fake, and you always feel like upset for the people who like got the fake. But then you had the sort of expert there, right? But like, what people don't realize, or whatever, um, I, I, and I, like, is that the biggest sort of market in the sneaker industry is not sort of your first point retail. It's not resale. It's knockoff. Like it's not it's it's shoes from China. It's like a four hundred fifty billion dollar industry, and a part of like knockoff luxury goods in general, right? So like I mean like and this is and like and I feel like knockoff has become like or counterfeit sneakers have become and even the term I hate the term counterfeit because that sort of adds a sort of that they are sort of assets even more than they are or whatever part of the sort of capitalist thing or whatever. But like the idea that sort of we would denigrate somebody for having a fake, a fake pair, for example, of like off-white Chicago's, right? That's like a what, a fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollars shoe on StockX, or whatever. Or like, yeah. like, of course they're gonna like. If, if I just want the look of the shoe or whatever, and like, none of you are going to be able to tell. I'll take two fifty for the for the for the knockoff in a second, right? And the fact that we sort of denigrate that when these companies are knocking off themselves all the time, Mm -hmm. right? Without any, like that's part of the business model, right? So with that question, why does authenticity matter, right? The the history that we talked about before, right? It's like, it's like you, you want to be a part of something. You, you, you want to be, you want a piece of that history for yourself, right? And, and, and the, the, the counterfeit, the knockoff version of the sneaker doesn't it doesn't get you that right. Like it doesn't. It's not a part of that. This is something that is is counter to that. 
you know, and it, it's 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 weird because and and I, I honestly used to be the guy who was like, oh, you're wearing fake kicks. That's so crazy. Hot. That's crazy. And I still think it's kind of crazy. Nah, I'm not going to no lie to you. But at the same <laughs> at the same time, I when when people tell me like, yo, I I can't I, I need the Travis ones or whatever. It's like I I understand it because it, one, like I understand like where you're, where you're coming from as somebody who may not be all the way in this, like, I'm in this, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I, I can't expect everybody to come to, 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 to this place, the same place that I'm at, and, and have that same perspective, especially people on the younger side, when you, get, when you, when you talk about people in the, in the teens and in the yeah. early 20s and things like that. It's like, okay, like, this is, this is really, this is all you've seen from, yeah. from this culture, and so you, you, really wanna, you really want a part of that no matter what, no, whether, whether it's the real thing or, or not. So, so like, I, I get it, but then, at the same time, I'm like, why don't you just wear something else? Like, there's just so much fly stuff out here for you to wear. And, yeah. and this goes back to, to the history and the culture and, and, and just, like, how we just make stuff fly yeah. mm -hmm. through, through our blackness, through our coolness. Like, why do you, why you don't just go and, and buy, buy a cool pair of Asics? But you that's know? what's hype. Like, that's what yeah. they see. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, that, those exactly. are their models. It's the exactly. rappers. It's the influencers. Mm -hmm. So, like, they want to be able to digest that. But... Faking the funk is not the way to do that. You can't. You, at all. you can't. You you you, you, <laughs> oh, yeah. you legit can't. And like the, the the thing is, like if you if you come around people like us, like it's like you're gonna embarrass yourself if you, if you walk out <laughs> yeah. there with like off white fake off white Jordan ones. It's like you can you can spot those. So it, well, not Aaron not, said not, he rocking them, so I don't know. I'm 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 not rocking them. I, I, not me. I said, <laughs> not me. No, don't, don't get it twisted <laughs> now. You said I've come a long feet. way. I <laughs> am not rocking them. But no. But, but, so, but what you're all getting to is like membership of the community, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And, and yeah. authenticity yeah. is one marker of membership. No, I, I think for me, like, so like, if, if yeah. we're gonna have like a class critique of like authenticity, right? As I guess the PhD, like, I, I'll sort of offer that, right? Like, authenticity, me to me is about. Uh, sort of gatekeeping and flag planning, right? Mm. So authenticity sort of is to say, boom, this is mine. Authenticity becomes the rules to sort of say you are an insider and an outsider, right? It's the reason why, so you see, you'll see like white kids from uh, uh, middle America who have no, who very few interactions with black people talking like black people online or whatever in sneaker, in sneaker sort of chat rooms and stuff like that, right? But then there's also gatekeeping. Right, this is to keep people out, right? And like, I think authenticity for too long, right, has kept out, like, we talk about women, has kept out we queer folks, has kept out disabled folks. Now, like, authenticity, right, the idea that, like, I got to be, I don't even know, like, to, like, what, what the, what was on the other side of that phrase, but to be whatever, I gotta have these $15,000 mm -hmm. shoes. I need these shoes, right? But use the people who, who say they need the shoes. They need them not because they, they actually want to, rarely do they want to wear them. They need them because they, want, they found a gold mine, right? And they're trying to get into, the, like, they're trying to hit a lick, right? And so, like, that's how I think about sort of authenticity, right? Is like, is like, it's, I feel like authenticity is never important to the people, or the, the gatekeeping of, of, of authenticity or the maintenance of it, right? is never important to the people who actually were in the communities to begin with. Like, sneaker culture used to be, like, as far as brands, right, so vibrant. You had Pony, you had uh, uh, people still wearing Keds. I mean, you used to have Converse or whatever, like, but you had so many different brands. I mean, like, there was the, uh, the G-Unit shoe. There was the uh, Jay-Z, the S. Doc Carter, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. so many different brands and, and collaborations and just cool, Sort of moments that were really, really authentic. You had Dapper Dan putting um, putting yeah, uh, Gucci. a Gucci fabric yeah. on, El on 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 Air Force Ones, right? So much cool stuff. And now, like authenticity, sort of is just Jays, just like retro, panda like, dunks. Yeah, 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 panda oh dunks, my gosh, right? No more panda. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so. Well, I think something that you said was important too. I feel like, per I don't know if I want to just say the younger generation, but. 
I think it can go to not having a sense of self and needing to like acquire a shoe. Like I don't find self-worth in the shoes that I wear. I express myself through them, but like if I don't have these shoes, I'ma still be fly. Like I'll still find a way to put something together, you know? And like what you said, like if I can't afford a $15,000 pair of shoes, I'll find something else that I like, you know? Like that might not just be my lane, but also like our worth is not in like objects that we wear and it's like we can like enjoy them and wear them and express ourselves through them but I think like a big thing is it it isn't a benchmark for our worth like we're so much more you know and um I just think that that's a good point of having that strong like just like self-love you know for ourselves as well yeah. no but yeah, I mean like I, I think it's that great like because it's not it's not exactly like youth culture but it is like I feel like the, like young right yeah. but it's, it's this idea like so, so right, it's a, it's a colleague of mine who has a son, right? Um, and his son uh, is uh, like a reseller, right? And like he has a business or whatever, and like the business isn't profitable in the sense that he's making money, but the business makes a lot of money. So for example, like he has probably lost money in the business, but over the course of a year, like, like I think, like uh, his his dad told me, like seventy at his as high as seventy five thousand dollars flowed into this account, the in and out of this account, right? Okay. One, you can't do that with a lemonade stand, right? You can't do that like working at Foot Locker, right? And we have this sort of group of the, this demographic of of youth, right, who grow up wanting to be sort of Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, these sort of titans of industry, right? And sneakers become sort of like gold in the 1800s mm -hmm. where you have people like that people are like prospecting sneakers like bots is a mining operation right like and i think that's where it gets like really really dangerous is this it's like like i got shoes just because i thought they were fly and at and at, at, at the sort of most sort of i think superficial because everyone else thought they were fly mm -hmm. but i'm still rocking the shoes right i'm not buying the shoe to, to sort of flip right or whatever, and like it, it, you flip to make thousands of dollars. I'm buying a shoe, and even in my example, Adrian, he's not buying a shoe to make thousands. He might make like sixty, seventy dollars or whatever. But like it's the like, and, and I think that's where sort of it gets caught, caught up is that sort of sneakers have become an asset, like a real asset class. Like people can invest their mm -hmm. money in sneakers because people think it's it holds value because they do hold value. I mean, they hold value. I mean, they do, but I mean, but we've seen resale is kind of it's kind of it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's starting to crack it's a little bit. It's not, it's not forever. It's not forever. You know, it's, it's like um, the, the, the dot com bubble, right? It's, it's like it, at, at, a, at a certain point, all of this is, is going to go away. And you're, you're going to see the people who are, are really here because they want to be here. Like people who want to be in, like the, you, you talk about um, membership in, in the community, like the people who really want to be members in that community, they will, they'll be there. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll stay there. But like, I, I think the, the, the misconception that so many people have just outside looking in is that like the cost of membership is is a fifteen thousand dollar shoe or fifteen hundred dollar shoe and, and it's just not like it's never it's never been that it it, yeah. it, it couldn't mm -hmm. be about that because that's not that's not what the community has ever been uh, like the 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 people who who made sneakers pop did not have fifteen hundred dollars yeah. no yeah to spend I mean, yeah. to spend on yeah. shoes and that that's yeah. just a fact so like you could you could go and and buy a, a Eighty dollar pair of Asics or something like that off offline and and like they could be fly they could be just as fly as these right here but it it, it, it all goes into to how you rock them how mm -hmm. you wear them man yeah, how much no. how much you 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 know you care about them like like Christina said like our our, our worth is not in these clothes it's, it's it's just how you feel about it what what it makes you feel your mm -hmm. your, your sense of self you know right, and yeah. I I think that that's something that 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 people just don't really realize about it so kind of moving forward in this regard reissues mm. or well, classic models and that narrative can only go so far before the hype collapses in the words of jerry lorenzo these are high quality ideas <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> uh so, wait, so wait, go, christine you're gonna say yeah, go oh I, I mean the very essence of a sneaker like I, that will always live on. Like sneaker is a lifestyle, you know? Um, I don't think that we can really look at a world where like sneakers don't exist. And what you were saying, I feel like 
certain trends may die down. Maybe the resale market dies down. I don't, I don't know that it will in the way that, that things have been moving, especially in like with technology. But I think that we will see um, sneakers continue on. I think it's infinite. I mean, if we're going to look at the connection with sneakers and blackness and the way in which blackness influences sneakers and streetwear and fashion, our appeal is infinite. So if we're linked with that, it, it forever goes on. It might take different forms, but I see it as something that continues on. I see it as something that we continue to tell great stories through um, and have like greater representation, more women, more designers, more artists, I think would be dope, like having you know the fusion of sneakers with art. But I, it's a lifestyle. It's not something that just will dissipate through time, you know? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I completely completely agree with Christina. I, I, I just think that um, this is something, it's not it's not the sneakers, it's the people, you know? Yeah. And, and the people, we're, we're not going anywhere. We, we love this stuff. We, because we love this stuff, other people love this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just don't, I don't know, as, as far as the, the resale market goes and, and, and the way that people talk about sneakers as, as an asset class, like sure, that, that, may, that may go somewhere, like that, that might wane at some point. Um, I don't think, it, it's never going to go away because sneaker resale has really always been a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's part of the history of it. Uh, but I, I, I just think that um, the, the way that, that people think about sneakers and, and, and the, the, the sort of the, the, the joy that it brings people, like that can't, that can't go away. I don't think that's something that can ever really disappear because there, there's nothing to really, really replace it, right? It, it, as long as it, it, it stays with the people that it needs to stay with, I, I, think, I think it's fine. Like, sure, like maybe like you won't see kids on YouTube like, wearing off-white Air Force Ones or whatever, but that's fine. Like, I was never really here for that anyway. Like, that, that never mattered to me, so. Yeah, I, I think for me, so I think, like, maybe I'm a little more pessimistic than the two of you. I think, so, like, I don't think sneakers go away in the sense, like, the people who wear sneakers stop wearing sneakers. I don't think I'll ever stop wearing sneakers or whatever. Um, and, like, I'm sure, like, I'll raise, or if I, when I have kids, I'll raise my kids in sneakers or whatever. It's a, it's a very, like, like I, like, to me, sneakers is about family and community. Like, I, like I, past pairs, I like I, so, but I think what has to change, and this is why I sort of, I joked at the beginning about sort of Jerry Lorenzo saying these are high level ideas, and they explained that joke, Jerry Lorenzo, he is, uh, um, I guess the creative director of Fear of God, he was in charge of Adidas Basket, is he still in charge of Adidas Basket? Uh, you know, who knows? Um, but yeah, but so he had this, he was talking about, like, somebody asked him, like, why do, do your clothes cost so much, or whatever, and these are like, Sort of like six hundred dollars for basically like a hoodie, taupe, like taupe hoodies. Like I mean, like, yeah. very, like very, very plain. Thing. He says these are, and, it's, and the quote is like, these are high level ideas. Uh, God, essentially, God didn't put me here to be cheap, right? And so, like to me, I think what has to bust, I think what will bust is the sort of, the sort of, the sort of streetwear luxury, sort of uh, connection. I don't think like every streetwear brand. I don't, I don't think the market can, can sustain for every streetwear brand to have $100 t-shirts and $600 hoodies or whatever, right? Like, it, there has to be sort of, like, a differentiation in the market or whatever. Sure. So, and I think sneakers are a part of this, right? Because sneakers, I think, like, are, like, a material anchor for streetwear culture. Like, no matter, I think, like, like I guess, like, and I, I'll put like this, like, I think, like, you can make the case that no matter what else you're wearing, like you are like rocking streetwear if you if you got a pair of a pair of fly kicks. Like I'm wearing a Chaps Ralph Lauren sweater and a pink hat with a teddy bear and I have some fly aces. Like but it still it still fits in the in the in the in the like material vernacular, right? So like like I agree with you. I don't think sort of the people go away, I don't think the stories go away, right? But I think like at least I would hope that the market sort of like like I'm actually hoping for like a uh, like a resale bust. I'm hoping for like like the Jordans, like just Jordans and everywhere and Ross and stuff like that because like I want sort of like I want the market to shift and I want people to be able to get sneakers when they want to get sneakers right. and not to not to think that they need to pay sort of thousands of dollars for what is like a, like like 
beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sort of uh, commodity artifacts. Like, like, uh, like. And I know I've mentioned Jordan a lot, but like the Adidas Superstar is a beautiful shoe. The Adidas mm-hmm. Campus is a beautiful shoe. Like New Balance, uh, the 990, a beautiful shoe. Air Jordan 3s, Jordan 11, beautiful shoes, right? Like without the without the sort of glitz and glam of sort of like faux luxury, right? It, it doesn't need that to, they were always fly, right? So I, like I'm, I'm actually hoping that like something drastically changes with sneakers. Excellent. Well, I, I think I've been driving the conversation for, for long enough, and I believe Andrea has a couple microphones. So we would like to open it up for, for comments and questions from the audience. Um, please. Ask away. <laughs> how y'all doing? Good, how are you? Good, good. Doing well, great to see you. Um, thank you for so much for this wonderful discourse and uh, the ideas shared about something I'm very passionate about, sneakers. Um, my name's Melvin, uh, ABD, PhD candidate in American Studies here. Um, raise my dissertation chair. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, my project is on blues epistemology, specifically black music, and if you want to get into the finite details, like Asian practitioners of black music. Um, and I bring up black music because we're talking about sneakers, and I feel like uh, you know, basketball culture in the 80s and the 70s is so synonymous also with hip hop, right? Hip hop is um, something that you know is so synonymous with sneaker culture as well, streetwear, all of these things, right? The four pillars, if you will. Um, and when y'all are speaking about authenticity in sneaker culture, specifically in the resale markets right now and with knockoffs, it makes me think about like, I'm a child of the 90s, but like the 90s aesthetics of like, you can't show up to a cypher performing somebody else's written rhymes, right? It's gotta be you, right? So this idea that like, even Drake or Kendrick Lamar might have used the Ghost Rider, right? Kind of like pokes holes in what makes them hard or what makes them heroes in like an older version, an older guard, if you will, of the culture. And it's so interesting now that simultaneously while sneakers are in this place where it's okay in certain spaces to wear a knockoff or you know, a, gray, a B grade, uh, it's also okay for artists to have ghost writers or ghost producers or not be kind of like putting forth what, when I speak of this old guard, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I'm sure, I see heads nodding, so I'm sure you understand that there was like a point in time where in hip hop, it was not cool for you to be faking the funk. And that is so synonymous to the attitudes that were being expressed most, brief, uh, most recently on stage when you all are uh, talking about B-grade culture. And so I bring this up to say, what do you think about almost the changing of this guard where we're in now, expanding upon what you've already said, and also like tying in these motifs and these ideas of like authenticity and hip hop, um, and what that means for us moving forward. Sorry if that's very multifaceted. But. No. I thank you for your question though. I think it's great of even like mentioning about music. I know we didn't get to like touch on that as much, but yeah. definitely when we look at sneakers, um, we're looking at fashion, we're looking at sports, but music, you know, and black youth, black and brown youth, they're able to see their idols not only, you know, on the basketball courts, but also in music videos and how much of that, that authenticity, that black cool that we were talking about, we see with, with our rappers, you know, and we see in their storytelling, it all goes hand in hand as a parallel of the stories we tell through our sneakers, the story we tell through our rhymes. And I agree 100% with you. I don't, I'm not with the faking the funk. Like, if, I'm, if you're gonna show up, you need to show up as your authentic self. That goes in what you wear, that goes in like how you present yourself. Like, every version of you needs to, to align, right? And like, there are, there are spaces where that works. And maybe that works for certain groups of people. For me personally, that like, I don't know, it clashes a little bit with just of how I show up and how I honor the ones that have come before me. So it's almost like doing a disservice if I would like allow certain things that aren't 
as real as they come, you know, but even what you were saying about when it comes to ghostwriters, it's just like, it's tough, right? Because there are, you know, songwriters and they're really talented. It's like, okay, if you're going to give them credit, that's one thing, right? And you allow space where different talents exist and coexist in a certain space. But I think specifically, um, not focusing on music, but with sneakers, I, me personally, I don't rock with like like anything that isn't real because it goes against the stories that we tell through sneakers. But um, thank you for that question. I'm glad that you tapped back into the to the music aspect because that's a really good correlation that you made between those two. Yeah, I, I um, amazing question. Honestly, amazing question because when I mean when you, when you think about sneaker culture, like hip hop is is directly rooted in it. Oh, yeah. When you think about uh, like you said, Run DMC, My Adidas, um, Air Force One, Nelly. Like there, there, there are so many different parallels that you can make, but like when you when you ask that, I, I, it, it, honestly, in in a roundabout way, like it, it, it reminds me of the stage of capitalism that we're in right now, where like, the, the thing about like when you when you think about hip hop, it's like presenting an image, right? Like you got to present yourself as as this person, like who who is real, who is authentic, or at least that's how it used to be, right? And and when you think about somebody like um, like Drake, for example, like nobody really cares anymore because the music is good, you know, and that's like, that's cool, I guess. But at the same time, it's, it's very, it's very weird. And, and I, I think that like, the fact that he can still sell the music kind of makes that, that an okay thing. And I, I feel like the, the same thing goes with, with wearing fake sneakers, right? Where like, you talk about people, um, you know, I, I like to call it a, a, a flex economy where like people are, are literally buying things just to say that they have it or they spent uh, $2,000 on a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. You buy the, the Travis one, a, a, a counterfeit version, a knockoff version of it, people see that, regular folks see that, they don't identify that it's fake. It looks like you're rich, man. Like it looks like you're rich and, and that's kind of, that's kind of the thing about it. It's like, it, and the same thing goes with hip hop. Like you got this, this fire verse that you just laid on the track and it was amazing, but you ain't write it. But guess what? Still hits, like it still hits. So I, I, I just kind of feel like it's, it's the same thing. It's all about uh, presenting that image, um, making it seem like something is, is, is something that it really isn't and, and making a, a buck off of that, that opportunity, you know? And, and, and so like, it, it's, 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 I don't like it. I don't like it. I understand where people come yeah, from. Mm -hmm. I try to be understanding about about all of this because you a lot of people like they don't they just don't really they don't have the um, the like they don't know what they don't know. Right. And, and like you have to you have to come come to it with, with an understanding of that. But it is like. It, it, it feels very bleak, I will say. It feels very bleak. I mean, me. it's like letting people do what they want to do. Like, shoot, if you like it, I love it. Like, you got it. It <laughs> don't have nothing to do with me. We, at the we end all of know what that means. We <laughs> all know what that means. No, and I think, I think both of them are exactly right. I think the one thing I would add, add to take the sort of conversation in a different direction, I think like your sort of, uh, sort of thinking about ghostwriters and stuff sort of had me thinking about like, so I think about Sneedy, Sneed Bus sneakers as uh, a medium, right? So like a medium has to deliver something, right? So, so the question is what is the, con for me, what is the content of sneakers, right? And that's sort of the thing that guides my work. And for me, that answer is emphatically blackness, right? The same way I think sort of we thought like hip hop is a medium, right? And the, the content that hip hop delivers more than lyrics, more than beats or whatever is blackness, right? Um, and like for me, for, for that to be sort of, for that to happen sort of in a sneaker, right? Or in, in a, like a material object that for the most part, black folks do not have, um, and brown folks do not have a sort of uh, um, a stake in, right? Is I think really, really problematic, right? In the sense that like, like, uh, like, 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 right open with this, I, I, this sort of, this sort of spiel, like, like we made this, right? And, and we did make this, right? But like, it goes away, not sort of in our control. It goes away, like, when sort of white owned companies go away, right? And white -owned, when our white owned companies sort of change their mind, and it looks like now they won't change their mind because blackness as content is profitable, right? And so, like, and I, 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 
I say that right not to say that sort of like all sneakers are quote unquote like black or or sort of give off black cool, but I do believe that like we can like you can measure sort of a sneaker's popularity almost directly um, by like who consumes like a, like like I would find like an Air Jordan uh, like Air Jordan three is black right for example, but a Hoka running shoe right is not black right. Both are popular shoes in their own right or whatever, and both do different things and both have like cult audiences around them, right? But like this idea that sort of this, I think, this thing and, and, and the, the new air movie with Ben Affleck and Matt Damon gives it this, like that was sort of created by white men, right? To sort of give off this sort of black essence that we can capture, that we can step in, I think it sort of gets this idea, sort of ghostwriting, ghost this, this idea that sort of there are sort of systems at play to deliver this product that we love, which is sneakers, right? And we should always sort of question that. And question sort of the sort of uh, um, identity relationships we have, like we have with that thing. That movie bothers me so much. Yes, I've, I've it's, not it's, seen it's, it yet. It's not out. It's not it's out. It's not out. It's not out. But just the concept of it, the thought of it, like I'm, go, I'm going to go see it. To, to be clear, like I, 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 I have to see it because I want to do like a review and yeah. I want to have like yeah. a complete picture of it. But like, yeah. I, it's like they're like, how do you white knight Michael Jordan? Like that's crazy. That's wild. But I, see, I like, don't. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean t to me, like, and, and, and I have big problems with the movie too. To me, like. The story, I guess this is the sort of interesting thing about Air Jordans. The story of Air Jordans is not about Michael Jordan. As he, he is sort of an agential character. Like, he has agency in the story. Air Jordans happened to Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. right? Like, sure. like, he didn't, sure. like, like, I mean, like, he's, he's been very open about this. Like, he wanted to sign with Adidas. His mama and his daddy wanted him to sign with Nike because mm -hmm. they loved, they thought the presentation was better. He didn't think Nikes were comfortable or whatever. To get him to sign, they had to give him a royalty deal, right? That the, the royalty deal ends up making him uh, uh, um, a billionaire, right? Like, I mean, like one torn ACL or whatever. Air Jordan is not a, is not a thing, right? So I mean, like to me, I think like it is. It presents, I think the movie is interesting because it presents, I think, a troubling truth that we've all kn known about Nike. Is that it's always been about sort of like white ego or whatever. And it's like the two main characters, Phil Knight and Sonny Vaccaro, right? Like the reason why they are not, they don't talk anymore is because they both think they have ownership over Air Jordan, right? Like Sonny Vaccaro is like, I'm the guy who found, I'm the guy who brought uh, uh, Jordan in. And it feels like this is my company, right? They, they, I mean, they both butt heads, like as sort of like, as, like to stake a claim on this black man sort of body, right? I mean, so like, like, but no, the, the movie is very problematic. I, I, like, I, I just think sort of like, like telling the the story of Air Jordan, where, where Michael Jordan is the protagonist, is a different movie and problematic in different ways, right? Because like Michael Jordan, like, I mean, we can't lie. Michael Jordan was like. He was not trying to be like the black savior. Like he wasn't in the yeah. in the streets, fist up. Like Michael was like, "Hey, I'm just a basketball player, right?" Like, and so I mean, no, I mean the, the movie is interesting. I, I, like it, it's definitely problematic though. Like, but I mean, it, like I would be surprised if the movie won Oscar though. If it becomes like this sort of like media, I would not be surprised. Uh, you're right. You're absolutely right. And, and it probably will. It probably will. <laughs> I I just I don't know, man. It's like I that all of that all of what you said is not like it's correct. It, it's it's totally right. But then like. I'm just like, but we're here now. Like we we know yeah. how this story plays out, yeah. you know, and like we know what the Air Jordan line is now. And to tell that story without Michael Jordan in the movie, pictured in the movie, I should say, at all, because I I, I believe he was involved in like the process of of creating it. But but like maybe, just maybe was it? I don't know. Just to have him in the yeah, movie or yeah. not in the movie, yeah. you know, it just—I it just, don't know. Like, I—I I, I don't feel like you can properly tell the story about. Like, sure, you can tell me the story about like, okay, these guys had the idea to to bring this rookie in, and it, it happened to me be Michael Jordan, and then and then things popped off. But things popped off, and that's the yeah, much more no, interesting yeah, part. Yeah. It's like you you are still. We talk about black cool to, to to bring it back, right? And and Mike. 
was black. Like that no, was, yeah. that's what that yeah. was. And that's no, yeah. why these shoes are what they are. So I, I just feel like, I don't know, like the, the story of Sonny Vaccaro, like sure, that, that's interesting. Phil Knight, not as interesting yeah, to me no, anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but I, just, I just don't really think that you can, you can't properly tell tell the story that way, in, in my opinion. But that, that's a that's a tangent, though. I didn't mean we to, gotta to watch shift the, movie. The, the conversation. We yeah. gotta we gotta watch yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> no, I, we should ask more questions. But I do. I mean, I think the question for me is that about the film is that for me it makes complete sense, right? And I think I agree with you, Aaron, that 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 Air Jordan was done to Michael Jordan. And that it was part of a long tradition of commodifying and selling black bodies through material objects without the black body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also, I would argue, I don't. I would say Jordan was a smaller component of making these shoes what they are. I would say the young black kids mm -hmm. who desired yeah. Yeah. and wore yeah. them with pride and belief. And Look at the marketing behind it. Look mm -hmm. at Spike Lee. Like, it's got to be yeah, the shoes. It's gotta be, it's gotta like, be if you shoes, wanted yeah. to be yeah, like shoes. him, you wore his shoes. It was a whole marketing campaign. No, and yeah. it works. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, like, Nike executives talk about, like, the stories, like, they were going into, like, New York, L.A., Chicago, uh. D.C., to basketball courts in the hood, giving out free pairs of shoes, right? They weren't doing that, like... It w that wasn't charity work. Like they were trying. That, that's a marketing campaign, right. Mm -hmm. right? That's the same as like you got the club promoter handing out flyers, right? Like like they are like okay, you get your first first taste. This is fly or whatever. And now we and now we can sort of build this sort of marketing campaign around around Michael Jordan. I mean, I don't know. I think like to me, I think I think like the story of sneakers, and, and this gets this gets like sort of like. Again, I guess to bring us back to the, the movie, right? The story of sneakers is not about, I don't think Michael Jordan or any one athlete, right? It's about like literally sort of something like we were told, like black people were literally like, told, like this is for you, right? Like the story of sneakers is about like black cool, yes, but it's about like, like in the 70s and 80s, that's one of the first generations of black folks to have sort of wealth to sort of spend it on other things, to spend it on, on, "Quote unquote luxury goods, right? Like there's a sort of a story, part of that story where like the reason why black folks in sort of quote unquote inner cities were wearing sneakers all the time is because they couldn't get access to sort of white collar jobs, right? They couldn't they couldn't get access to the sort of the sort of uh, uh, burgeoning neoliberal economy and offices where they had to wear suits, right? Like it's 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 so much sort of like." at stake or whatever that has nothing to do with like the black people, right? But has, and, and I think that's the thing that's like really just like a, to see it in a film and in a film where I am, I imagine that Phil Knight and Sonny Vaccaro are going to be the hero. Or like I know there's going to be, it's going to piss me off. There's going to be a, a scene in the film where some white man says or whatever, think about the little black kids or whatever. And you're going to be like, you know, I mean, really? I mean, so I mean, like, no, but like, like, I, I don't know. But thinking about sort of, as you say, like, like sneakers is something that like happened to black people, or whatever, and we and like we took it and ran with it, right? Like, but yeah, I mean, like, but no, but like, but like, it, it, it's so so much like so like, I think about like all the Air Jordan stuff or whatever, like all all the moments, the shattered backboard, the flu game, Space Jam, right? Like, and I just think about like how much of like kind of like an odd person Michael Jordan was like he's not a fashion I mean he's not a fashion icon aside from the Jordans and he only wore them because he was contractually obligated to wear them like I mean like to me like the 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 story for example my favorite Air Jordan the Air Jordan 11 right the story of the Air Jordan 11 is a really like a stupid idea like Michael Jordan wanted a shoe he could wear with a suit or whatever like that sounds like a really dumb idea and then they took designers or whatever and we got this beauty or whatever, but like it's, it's, it's a like to me, it's a, like if Air, if Michael Jordan has like agency in that movie, it's kind of like comic relief, which is which is sad to me. I mean, he just can play basketball really well, and he gamble. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, just a short question, I guess. But oh, here's the mic. I project though, so it might not 
you might not need it. Hello. It is streaming too, so. I'm sorry? It's streaming too, so <laughs> yeah. And oh, okay, for the streamers. Um, what are your thoughts on the businesses where people paint on sneakers? Do In regards to like the perspective of authenticity, um, is there a room for those types of business in the sneaker industry? Is this a solely uh, like a personalized, customized business? What are your thoughts on, on that? I'll let Christina, you want to Oh, start? I mean, I like, love for it. For example, yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, in terms of like popular culture, like I, I just recently saw somebody paint like a boondocks, like Jordan 1, where like granddad is like whipping the belt and it's the Nike sign. You know what I mean? So what are your thoughts on, on those types of businesses? I haven't seen that. That is wild. But um, no, I think it goes back into what we were talking about of like self-expression. Like I, I love seeing um, like people bring their sneakers to life in whatever way that feels comfortable for them, whatever way that allows them to tap into who they are and to see themselves. and. Um, I'm all for the creative aspect. Like my dad actually painted a pair of like forces for me, and oh, it, it yeah it, it it I mean it gave it a whole new meaning. This pair, you know, and being able to have that connection with him and always be able to carry that. So when I see um, artists and creatives kind of fusing their talent with sneakers, um, it 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 gives me a sense of pride of just seeing that connectivity when it comes to creativity and also like these are our canvases, you know? And um, I think that there is fluidity in history, but also making something our own too. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. It's um, seeing, seeing customization and, and art on sneakers has always been something for me that like I, I've always loved to see it. And, and when you think about it, you talked about Dapper Dan earlier and, and how he put the Gucci print on, mm -hmm. um, on the Air Force One, like that's that's some of the gold. earliest examples that, that we see of that. That was that was gold back yeah. then. Man. Gold, that yeah. gold. That oh was, my gosh. That was it was amazing, and and it's something that brands are copying today. Now, mm -hmm. when you look at the the Louis Vuitton Air Force One that they're yeah. selling for uh, ten thousand dollars or whatever, um, but but I also think that that's something that's also in jeopardy when when yeah. you look at the landscape and you look at um, you know Nike suing all these different folks where where like they're they're copying. Um, their their designs. Uh, you got Cool Kai with the the uh, <laughs> with the um, I don't even know what is what what the lightning bolt. Uh, yeah, with the lightning bolt Jordan Jordan yeah. one. That that is obviously a, a riff on the Jordan one and um, the whole Warren Lotus thing and the John yeah. Geiger thing with with the Air yeah. Force one. And like I understand the, uh, the 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 business aspect behind it of, of wanting to to protect trademarks and and um, and also why people don't necessarily like those sneakers because they are very clear riffs on on things and, and it's not it, it's not really art you're just putting a, a different logo there so it's not like it's fake in the funk like we, we were just talking about right but at the same time there there's some of me that's like yo okay nike is is suing all of these people suing these these businesses or whatever like what does that look like when they come at somebody for a simple customization Right, like what is what is that? What 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 standard? What precedent does this set for somebody who who you know just just wanted to to draw on some shoes and just started selling mm -hmm. them, selling selling their art out of the trunk, right? Like, do do does that person fall under this umbrella for Nike? Would would Nike come after this person? And 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 if they do, what happens? You know, and and that's kind of something. Like, I'm always going to be on the side of of the little guy. You know, mm -hmm. I, 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 these big corporations, like they're fine. Nike's always going to be fine, whether whether uh, Warren Lotus is selling uh, lookalike dunks or not. Yeah. But at the same time, if if they're if they're weeding these these little folks out, then then what does that what does that leave us with? Where where do where does where does our creativity as uh, um, as a consumer base, as as just general artists, as creatives, where does where does that fit into this this whole picture? So it's definitely something that I'm. I'm really worried about moving forward with, with the, the sneaker industry at large. So yeah, for me, right, one, I think, like, to me, customizers and sneaker art is, like, the best and most exciting thing about sneakers sort of writ large, right? So, like, so like for example, one of my favorite customizers, uh, a guy named Juan Wilson, does amazing, oh so amazing, so and, like, and it's, like, just so, like, subtle or whatever, like, whatever. And so, I guess to answer your question about how they fit, um, in the larger sneaker industry, I would say sort of 
like, so my short answer would be they don't, right? But the long answer is, right, like, the way sort of Nike and Adidas exist in this sort of um, economic marketplace is that the sneaker customizer can only exist sort of as like a very, very, very little like guy or whatever, like, I mean, like a, like a little bit, just like a non sort of competing entity, right? Or they get big enough or they get uh, their talent enough to get hired, right, as a shoe designer, or they get sort of like litigated out of the market, right? Like no, like, like, n- very few, like Nike's gonna win and he's gonna win like a lot of those cases, which is why I think like the fact that like John Geiger um, with his Geiger shoes or whatever, like he settled and he could still do the job, mm-hmm. which, which is, 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 a, is a big thing. Like for example, Nike is, have they settled with Baby? Are they, are they, are they still suing? No, nah, they're, still, no, they're still in the process. Right, yeah, so I mean, but even that, that's why Baby's been around for All these years like tw- 20 years now almost, right? Baby's, baby, baby's old in the tooth, right? But like, but I also think like there is sort of, and this is part of like why I say sneakers are like a very American artifact. It's like a problem that sort of like these arts and customizers are arts in the same way graffiti uh, artists are artists, right? Like the fact that like the sort of the default way that they share their art is to sort of is to make a brand and sell the brand or whatever. Like like to me like to, to me like. I think of a custom like, like a Basquiat or a Nina Chanel Avenue piece or whatever. Like, I don't need their, I don't need to wear the shoe to be able to sort of appreciate the shoe. The shoe could be in a museum, right? But like, America, like sort of the art history of America is so tied to commodity, right? It's so tied to 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 sort of uh, to buying and selling in a way that sort of it's not. And for example, in Europe, um, and 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 other places, they're just older, right? So like. Like for me, like like I think the question, like if I could talk to a, cu- a customizer right now, like to me the question is that I would ask back to them is why would you want to be a part of an industry that at best wants to consume you, like literally wants to take all of your stuff and sell it for them without any credit or whatever? Because very very rarely do know the designers of a shoe. That's getting better now. Or if you actually do get big enough, they're actually trying to destroy you. Right, so like, I'm like, like, what are some other ways we can think about sort of, um, and other avenues to sort of present your artwork as sort of, not like, designer in that sort of neoliberal sort of kind of like job title, but as artists, right? Like, I, I think, I think, I think that's for me is where like I would sort of, like, hope that sort of, customizers and shoe artists are th- are thinking about their work not as sort of being, in a marketplace, but being in in a museum, right, in a collection, right? So as we're coming up on, oh, did you have a question? Please. I've got a quick one, maybe. So one thing I've noticed is that uh, I think all of you up there are wearing shoe designs that were designed more than 10 years ago, with the exception of maybe Aaron. (coughs) Um, But like, I don't know what it's all about. I'm sorry, keep, keep going, Bill. But uh, my question is, like, we, I feel like the popularity of newer silhouettes is kind of very low compared to um, older silhouettes. Do we think that this is just a trend of now, or do we think that going into the future there's less and less new silhouettes that are becoming kind of popular? That's a tough one, Ben. I, I, uh, <laughs> that's tough because I, I, I do think that it's, it's definitely a trend of, of right now. I think that's something that we see a lot today. And obviously, like, this stuff had to start somewhere, so it hasn't always been a thing. But when I look at the, the work and the collaborations that, that um, you know, companies are putting forward, it, it's always some, on something that's old, right? Like, mm-hmm. you don't see Nike doing anything with, like, a, a, a space hippie collab, for example, yeah, right? Yeah. Something that came out in um, in twenty twenty, and it's like uh, it's a really nice shoe. It's it's mm-hmm. it's cool. It's comfortable. It's it's also sustainable, uh, which is really cool. And, and like you just don't really see them them working with that kind of thing. There's no there's no there's no hype behind it, and and you wonder when that that's ever going to shift, you know? And and it's it's hard to tell because I feel like the the consumer is the one that 
like we should be telling the brands what's cool. It's, it it mm -hmm. shouldn't be the other way around. Yeah. And I feel like once we get back to to that, because because right now the paradigm is, has shifted, where like Nike will will uh, bring back the um, the Oreo fives and call them the Moonlight fives, and and yeah. like it'll they'll tell you why the shoe was cool and why you should go buy it instead of you telling Nike this shoe was cool and just going to buy it yourself. You know, so I I, I think at at a certain point. As um, yeah, as as the overall market, uh, the secondary market value of, of some of these sneakers trends down, and, and you, you see a lot of the um, the more hype beastie people sort of uh, wean out of, of the space. I think we get back to people finding new things to wear, finding new things to to love, and and, and kind of going from there. But also, I feel like now more than ever. It's, and, and this this is especially present in in basketball sneakers, like we were just talking about. Like there are no, there are no, there's no sneakers out there that you would even want to wear, right? Like it, it, it's like they're, they're they're not only are they only focusing on 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 retro and and um and things that that have already worked before, but they're also it just doesn't really feel like there are any any brands out there coming with with new particularly new ideas outside mm -hmm. of of a select few that, that you may see um, throughout the year. And, and, and maybe that's a thing of, of, of marketing. Maybe there is more coming uh, in, in the next few years, but, but it's definitely something that is, that is concerning. And, and I, I just feel like once, once the consumer, like I said, kind of flips the paradigm back on its head and, and, and things kind of go the way that they were going before, I think we see a shift, but I have no idea when that's coming. I think for me, right, I think like the, the question of retro, right, is sort of gets back to the sort of like how the like the, the sort of structure of the sneaker market, right? And that sort of like if I missed the if I missed, for example, with uh with uh, Christina's Bread Eleven, if I missed those when they came out three years ago or five years ago, like like I like it's, it's the sort of like uh Pavlovian tick or whatever, like I know it's gonna come back again. So I I know I have another chance at this lottery. Right. And then also, I mean, like there, I mean, like when you have something like I think as, as a as a company, a corporate entity, when you have something that that sells. Right. Like it's it, like it's going to sell forever. Right. Like it seems like whatever. Like why? Why would you stop putting it out? And I, I think that to me, the, the interesting thing about sort of your question, Ben, is that sneaker sneaker companies are trying to do two things at once. They're trying to be sort of this uh, like through retro, this sort of. Uh, archivist, archaeologist, this thing, this entity that preserves history or whatever, and you see that a lot on like the content on like sneakers app, confirmed app, on the websites or whatever, like all oh, like the stories behind the shoe. And that's that's all great, right? Um, but then also at the same time, they're trying to be like these cutting edge, super tech companies, right? Mm -hmm. And it's and like you have like just like, I mean, again, I mean, I think Sykes is right. Like, there's n like. I can't think of any good basketball shoe that's not a Kobe or a Jordan right now or whatever. And that's sad, right? I mean, like, like, like any, like, just like a fresh silhouette that just looks like, oh, that looks good, not because it reminds me of an older shoe or because it's a different colorway of an older shoe. It just looks good because this is like the new shoe. Like, no one is wearing the Air Jordan. Were they 38, 39? Yeah, they, were, like they, they just, we just saw pictures of the 38 mm. the other day. And yeah, no one's wearing that or whatever. Yeah. Like, but when the 11s come out, though, everybody's gonna go crazy. <laughs> right, exactly. I hoop in them. I don't wear them. That's yeah. how. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. And that that sucks. Like, it honestly sucks. Cause like, I know I, I'm a huge basketball fan. I'm a huge NBA fan, and and I want to be able to wear some of those sneakers. But at the same time, it's like. I can't, man. It's like I can't. It's 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 bad. It's bad. It reminds me of the uh, the Dom Kennedy bar on uh, Platinum Shell. Don't wear LeBron to the club. <laughs> they are. That's all. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Well, I think on that note, um, it's just a shade close to seven o'clock. And thank you all who have stayed for the whole period to talk about sneakers. But most importantly. Thank you, Christina, Mike, and Aaron for just really giving us such a wonderful Thank you. Thank you. commentary.
about blackness, sneakers, and culture. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you for moderating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you all. Me. Thank you us. Appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening. That was great. That was great. Thank you so much. That was dope, man. That was dope. So glad. That was.